I have to admit that I have never really understood why it is that journalistic outlets or ones that claim to be involved in a principally journalistic function every two years prior to an election issue their instructions for how people ought to vote. They endorse particular candidates the way, say, an activist group would or a donor group would. And by doing so, in my view, they attach themselves to that politician so that if that person wins, there's some sort of subconscious, at least, desire to see them succeed because you are the one who encouraged people to go and vote for them. You've kind of placed yourself on their side. And I think placing yourself on the side of a politician so explicitly, so blatantly, is at the very least unjournalistic. It has no journalistic function to me. And one could even argue that it's anti-journalistic, that it really is a contradiction of what is supposed to be the journalistic function, which is holding all powerful parties account, regardless of which side they are or who they are. But it has become commonplace an expectation that major media outlets, especially the nation's largest newspapers, as well as, as, well as local newspapers, especially before a presidential election, endorse the candidate that they want to see win the national election. And for papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times, it's basically automatic that they endorse the candidate who is representing the Democratic Party. You have to go back many, many years for you to find the Washington Post endorsing a Republican candidate. Since at least 2004, it's been John Kerry, Obama, Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, and there was obviously an expectation that the Washington Post, like the New York Times has already done, would come out and announce that it was imperative that the nation elect Kamala Harris and reject Donald Trump. And yet that's not what the Washington Post has decided to do. Apparently the top editors of the Washington Post were all ready to do what exactly was expected of them. They actually drafted an endorsement of Kamala Harris that they were preparing to publish within the next few days. And by all reports, the owner of the Washington Post, the person who bought it for $250 million more than a decade ago back in 2013, Amazon co-founder and multi-billionaire Jeff Bezos overrode that decision and decided that the newspaper should not issue endorsements, not just this year, but for all future elections. Now, the Washington Post, after Bezos bought the paper, did endorse in 2016, they endorsed the election of Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. They then endorsed in 2020 Joe Biden over Donald Trump. And so the expectation was that they would endorse Kamala Harris over Donald Trump. And yet Bezos intervened and said he thought it inappropriate for newspapers that are expected to be trustworthy to all sides of the political spectrum to continuously announce that they were supporting the Democratic Party candidate. Here from the Washington Post today, is the leadership of the Post, namely a note from the publisher who runs the paper for Jeff Bezos, announcing why it is that they have made this decision. A note from the publisher. Quote, the Washington Post will not be making an endorsement of a presidential candidate in this election, nor in any future presidential election. We are returning to our roots of not endorsing presidential candidates. As our editorial board wrote in 1960, the election where John Kennedy was running against Richard Nixon and obviously coastal elites were petrified of a Nixon presidency, very much wanted JFK to win. And when the Washington Post refused to endorse in that race, as they had previously done, this is what they explained. Quote, the Washington Post has not, quote, endorsed either candidate in the presidential campaign. That is in our tradition and accords with our action in five of the last six elections. The unusual circumstances of the 1952 election led us to make an exception when we endorsed General Eisenhower prior to the nominating conventions and reiterated our endorsement during the campaign. In light of the hindsight, we retain the view that the arguments for his nomination and election were compelling. But hindsight has also convinced us that it might have been wiser for an independent newspaper in the nation's capital to have avoided formal endorsement. We recognize that this will be read in a range of views, including as a task for an endorsement of one candidate, or as a condemnation of another, or as an abdication of our responsibility. This is inevitable, but we don't see it that way. 
Our job at the Washington Post is to provide thorough, uh, through, is to provide through the newsroom nonpartisan news for all Americans and thought provoking reported views from our opinion team to help our readers make up their own minds. Most of all, our job as a newspaper of the capital city of the most important con uh, country in the world is to be independent, and that is what we are and will be. Now, there's obviously a hugely disingenuous component to the Washington Post decision, which is everybody knows exactly what the Washington Post wants to happen in the 2024 election. Everyone knows that the Washington Post wants Kamala Harris to win and Donald Trump to lose. It's reflected in everything they say and do. I don't think they have a single pro-Trump op-ed columnist on their staff, just as the New York Times does not. I believe every op-ed writer on that staff, maybe with the exception of one at the Post, Mark Thiessen, none at the New York Times, are supporters of Kamala Harris, or at least are uh, neutral. But there's almost no pro-Trump representation in this because obviously the Washington Post being a newspaper composed of coastal liberals from the same set of nine or ten elite colleges in a culture of American liberalism catering to American liberals wants the Democratic Party to win. That's why they've endorsed the Democratic candidate for the last 25 years. So this idea that, oh, we're independent and we don't want to choose sides is, I suppose, valid for as long as it goes, which is not very far. But nonetheless, I think it's a very valid and probably su superior view to say that why are we, as, new, as a newspaper, endorsing a candidate or telling people how to vote? We should give them all the information we believe was accurate about everyone running and then leave it up to the voters to make up their own minds. I think that's a very valid perspective, even if their biases are obvious. The Washington Post itself published a news story about what was going on inside the Washington Post from today. And the headline was, the Washington Post says it will not endorse a candidate for president. Quote, publisher William Lewis explained the decision as a return to the newspaper's roots. Quote, an endorsement of Harris had been drafted by Post editorial page staffers, but had yet to been, be published, according to two sources briefed on the sequence of events who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly. The decision to no longer publish presidential announcements was made by the Post owner, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. Quote, this was a Washington Post decision to not endorse and I would refer you to the publisher's statement in full, said she, the, the chief communication officer, Kathy Baird. Now, to say this did not go over well with pretty much every single person in the liberal sector of the corporate media, which is almost all of them, and liberal operatives and Democratic Party officials in Washington is to wildly understate the case. Marty Barron was the longtime Washington Post editor, and prior to that, he led the Boston Globe, including in its Pulitzer winning investigation into the cover up of molestation inside the Catholic Church, which became the subject of an award winning film called Spotlight. And he then went to the Washington Post, where he ran the Post for many years, and he was indignant over what he saw as an abdication of the journalistic responsibility to tell voters how to vote. Here from the Boston Globe, the headline, former Washington Post editor Marty Barron slams newspaper for not making presidential endorsement. Quote, this is cowardice with democracy as its casualty. Barron, also the former editor of the Boston Globe, wrote on X, quote, real Donald Trump will see this. Donald Trump will see this as an invitation to further intimidate Jeff Bezos and others. Disturbing spinelessness at an institution famed for courage. Now, there's so many things to dissect there about that self-serving, self-glorifying depiction that he offers of himself and the Washington Post and the US corporate media in general as being so brave. What kind of bravery would be required for the Washington Post to do what it always does every four years, which is endorse the Democratic president? And the idea that somehow Donald Trump has intimidated Jeff Bezos, on whom the U.S. security state relies through Amazon for a whole variety of crucial contracts, one of the two or three richest men on the planet, 
that somehow Trump's going to say, oh, look, I, am, I intimidated Jeff Bezos, and that it, it's some kind of act of important courage for the Washington Post to have done what everybody expected them to do, what every major newspaper in the United States routinely does, ritualistically, which is endorse the Democratic press, is so, is so deceitful, so self-glorifying. But even worse is this notion that somehow democracy is a casualty of a newspaper's decision to try and remain as neutral as possible, as though democracy depends upon American voters being guided by their superiors, by these newspaper editors and owners, to tell them how to vote. And without that, democracy can't possibly uh, th survive because then people will be left on their own to make their own choices, which is very much how these people see their role in society. They just don't usually say it quite as explicitly, but they're so enraged at what's happening. And I think a part of this is this growing desperation in the face of not very encouraging polling data that continues to emerge that's certainly not dispositive in the sense that it proves Kamala will lose and Trump will win, but certainly continues to undercut a lot of the optimism that Democrats had weeks and a couple of months ago as we've gone over last night, which is why they're resorting to the desperation of Trump is Adolf Hitler. And a lot of this is based on this idea that Trump is Adolf Hitler and it's the moral duty of every newspaper to stand in defense of American democracy by condemning Trump. Now, the other aspect that's just so delusional about this perspective is that they continue not to understand the extent to which Americans in large, large numbers hate these newspapers, distrust these newspapers, scorn these newspapers, believe that they deliberately lie in order to advance their own political agenda. Do you think there's huge numbers of undecided voters in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Arizona and Nevada and North Carolina and Georgia waiting on edge to tell that have the Washington Post of all outlets tell them how, who to vote for? And that somehow this is some great loss because now the Washington Post, the people in this country don't get the benefit of hearing the Washington Post tell them how to think and how to behave as if anybody cares what the Washington Post even thinks. But these people live in this completely self-contained world, totally self-delusional, where they feed themselves these glorifying narratives about the role of newspapers and their feisty and courageous defense of Democracy, which means endorsing the Democratic Party candidate in every, every election, and the quote-unquote failure or refusal of the Washington Post, and as you'll see, the LA Times, to fulfill their role is something that they cannot contain. I mean, the amount of psychotic responses by very recognizable names is almost hard to express. Now, here from Semaphore, which is just another new digital outlet, the headline was, editor resigns, subscribers cancel, as Washington Post's non-endorsement prompts crisis at Jeff Bezos' paper. Quote, the first prominent journalist, editor-at-large Robert Kagan, resigned Friday in response to the decision Semaphore first reported, but there may be more. Quote, people are shocked, furious, surprised at an editorial board member, citing internal discussions around resignation. Quote, if you don't have the balls to own a newspaper, then don't. I mean, if this person is so offended at what the Washington Post did and accusing Jeff Bezos of lacking balls, what does it say about them that they're unwilling to object to raise their voice in defense of democracy and against fascism and the, the uh, new Adolf Hitler on the horizon if they're not even willing to object under their own name instead hiding behind anonymity? The article goes on, quote, members of the Post editorial board were taken aback on Friday when they learned about the decision from top opinion editor David Shipley. The board had drafted an endorsement of Harris this, earlier this month, which was sent to the paper's owner, Jeff Bezos. On Friday, NPR reported that an opinion staff learned the news from a, from a, a, at a tense meeting shortly before Lewis's announcement. One person familiar with the figures told Semaphore that the decision already seemed to be impacting subscriptions in the last 24 hours, ending Friday afternoon, about 2,000 subscribers canceled their subscription, an unusually high number, an employee said.
What does it say about people who subscribe to the Washington Post and then cancel the minute the Washington Post refuses to endorse Kamala Harris? Like generally the reason you're supposed to read a newspaper is to have access to the reporting to understand what's going on in the world. Not because you expect them to be an activist group on behalf of your ideology or political party, but of course that's exactly what the expectation now is of all of these papers who cater to a very specific political camp and an ideological faction, generally just affluent, highly educated people who live on the East and West Coast who support the Democratic Party almost entirely. That's the readers of the New York Times and the Washington Post, and they're not subscribing because they want to learn about the world. They're subscribing almost the way you donate to a group with a cause that you support. If you want to prioritize gun rights, you're going to give to the NRA. If you believe in abortion rights, you're going to give to Planned Parenthood. If you believe in the Democratic Party, you're going to give to the Washington Post and the New York Times. And the minute that either of them and any of them fail to advance your agenda, you're going to pull your money back because you're not actually reading them to learn anything. You don't really want them to do reporting. You want them to be activists on behalf of your candidate. And because the Washington Post, in this case, at least explicitly decided this year not to, you have all these liberal journalists demanding that everybody cancel their subscriptions. The article goes on, quote, another person who has seen the numbers downplayed them, saying the rate of cancellation Friday was, quote, not statistically significant, which is, I'm sure, what's going to happen. You're going to have a lot of media melodrama over this, but people don't follow and listen to what liberal pundits tell them to do. Here is the former Obama National Security Advisor and the current Biden White House official, Susan Rice. Here's how she reacted today upon this announcement that the Washington Post would not be endorsing, quote, so much for democracy dies in darkness. This is the most hypocritical, chicken shit move from a publication that is supposed to hold people in power to account. Again, where would this idea come from that it's somehow courageous to endorse Kamala Harris and cowardly not to. And yes, newspapers are supposed to hold the powerful to account. Right now, the powerful are the people occupying the White House. That's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And what they're angry about isn't the Washington Post's failure to hold Kamala Harris to account. They're angry at the Washington Post's refusal to cheerlead for Kamala Harris openly, explicitly in this election because that is what their actual expectation of media outlets is not to inform the world, not to do reporting, not to hold powerful people accountable, but to do everything possible to help the Democratic Party win and to defeat Trump. That really is what they believe is the overarching primary moral duty and function of the corporate media, a purely partisan activist entity as they see it. And because the Washington Post decided to keep a little bit of a pretense of being a neutral journalistic outlet, they're enraged because they don't think that's what journalism is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about helping the Democratic Party vanquish Donald Trump. Speaking of people who believe that, Brian Stelter, who was on, on CNN and then got fired from CNN and is now back on CNN, here is what he said in his reaction today. Quote, a member of the Washington Post editorial department tells me Jeff Bezos' decision not to endorse is, quote, an outrageous abdication of responsibility. What abdication of responsibility to tell voters to vote for Kamala Harris? That's the responsibility of journalists and newspapers? He went on, quote, democracy doesn't die in darkness. It dies when people anticipatorily consent to a fascist whim. They're trying to create this narrative that the reason Jeff Bezos didn't allow the Washington Post to endorse Kamala Harris is because he's so petrified of the concentration camps Donald Trump is about to build and the Nazism and tyranny that's about to descend on our country if Trump wins, that he's trying to curry favor with Donald Trump by not allowing his news. Imagine thinking that that's what Jeff Bezos' thought process is. The only people who think that tyranny is on the horizon, that Donald Trump is going to build camps, are insane liberal pundits who listen to MSNBC or read the New York Times op-ed page today. The rest of the world doesn't actually believe that, doesn't think that way, as polling overwhelmingly shows. Just a little bit more of this kind of reaction here from 
Hank Hoffman, here's how he responded. Fuck the fucking cowardly Washington Post. Obeying in advance the Post's cowardly plutocratic owners, talking about you, Jeff Bezos, lick the boots of Donald Trump, traitors to a free press and a free country. All because they wouldn't cheerlead for Kamala Harris. Here is the uh, former actor Mark Hamill, who appeared in some Star Wars films and now is a very vocal democratic activist, a crazy liberal resistance uh, freak on Twitter. Here's what he said. Just canceled the newspaper that told us, quote, democracy dies in darkness. Hashtag boycott the Washington Post. And this is very representative of the sort of uh, reaction here, by the way, is he attached his cancellation notice to his tweet. We're sorry to see you go. And it's his cancellation notice to the Washington Post because they didn't do what he thinks they ought to do, the function they ought to serve, which is cheerlead for the Democratic Party. The always uh, sober Keith Olbermann added, democracy dies in the Washington Post. They're all playing on this phrase that the Washington Post adopted right at the start of the Trump presidency, democracy dies in darkness. Here is John Ralston, who's a uh, journalist in Nevada, journalism dies in darkness. As always, they have the same script they read from. They're just like a hive mind. Such complete groupthink. Here's Congressman Ted Lieu, the congressman from California. Quote, the first step toward fascism is when the free press cowers in fear. Does it seem to you like the media is afraid of Donald Trump, is afraid of reporting negatively on Donald Trump? Does the corporate media do anything else in this country besides spend every day denouncing Trump as a fascist and a liar and as a Hitler figure? Does it seem like media outlets are hiding in the corner, petrified of Donald Trump? Here's Molly Young Fast, Democracy Dies in Sunlight. Here's Joan Walsh, the former editor-in-chief of Salon.com when I was there. Uh, she was my colleague for a long time. She now writes for the nation. She's a fanatical Democratic uh, partisan, and this is what uh, she wrote. Uh, she wrote, and this is that hilarious, I think. She wrote, I just canceled my subscription to the Washington Post. You should too. And you can see it went pretty viral. Almost 2,000 retweets, 9,000 likes, probably more now. Uh, this was, in fact, at 1.14 p.m., so it's much more now. So she's saying you should also cancel the, your subscription to the Washington Post for failing to do what they're supposed to do. And then someone in response said to her, a more effective protest, given that it's Jeff Bezos who did this, would be for everyone to stop shopping on Amazon. And then Joan Walsh said in response, that's much harder, but I'll consider it. So in other words, look, I want to do everything possible to stop fascism and the new Adolf Hitler from taking power, so I'll cancel my Washington Post subscription. And when someone said to her, hey, maybe you should also boycott Amazon, she's like, I'm not going to miss my shows on Amazon Prime. Just an anger of this. I'm not going to stop shopping on Amazon. That's way too hard. I'll just I'll, I'll click a button on and cancel my subscription. I'm not going to stay away from Amazon and all the off, all, all, awesome things it has to offer. Obviously, if you really believed anything that you were saying that the, this Donald Trump was Adolf Hitler, that Jeff Bezos was helping him get elected, I think you'd be willing to sacrifice your the shows you love to watch on Amazon Prime and the great discounts you get by shopping on Amazon. But that's a little bit too hard even when it comes to battling fascism. Now, let's just remind everybody, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post in August of 2013. That's more than a decade ago. The Washington Post to be sold to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. That was the uh, headline in the... Washington Post itself, and yet, as I said, uh, since then, the Washington Post endorsed Hillary Clinton in 2016, even when Donald Trump won, and then Joe Biden in 2020 when he was running against Trump, and I think Jeff Bezos ended up okay. I don't believe he's been put in any camps. I don't think he lost any contracts, Amazon contracts with the CIA or the Pentagon. I don't recall any of his wealth being seized by Donald Trump with no due process as punishment for having endorsed Trump's opponents, but this is what I'm saying. They, they have really talked themselves into this frenzy because they only, you have to realize that these liberal journalists who work at 
New York Times, MSNBC, and CNN, they only talk to and amongst each other and for each other. And so I know a lot of people think, no, they don't really believe this. They're cynically pretending. No, they really do believe it. If you immerse yourself enough in a particular culture with a certain set of orthodoxies and pieties and worldviews that just repeat them over and over and over and, and insist on acceptance of them, you will eventually start believing them, even if you didn't start off believing them and were only going along for whatever cynical careerist moves you have. These people really do believe that this time it's going to be all different. This time they're really going to the camps if Donald Trump wins. Now, as I said, the Washington Post wasn't the only paper who refused to endorse Trump, uh, Kamala despite the expectation that they would do so. The Los Angeles Times did the same thing. Here from Semaphore, two days ago, this is on Wednesday, October 22nd, the Los Angeles Times won't endorse for president. Quote, the owner of the Los Angeles Times has blocked the paper from endorsing a candidate for president this year. Last week, the LA Times published its electoral endorsements for the 2024 election. And while the paper noted in its first line that it, quote, is no exaggeration to say this may be the most consequential election in generation, that was the only mention of the presidential race and its endorsements. The paper's editorial board, which has endorsed Democratic candidates in every presidential race since it first endorsed then Senator Barack Obama in 2008, was preparing to do so once again this election, but according to two people familiar with the situation, executive editor Terry Tang told editorial board staff earlier this month that the paper would not be endorsing a candidate in the presidential election this cycle, a decision that came from the paper's owner, Dr. Patrick Soon Shuang, a doctor who made his fortune in the healthcare industry. The paper did not explain its decision, though it noted at the bottom of its online endorsement page that, quote, the editorial board endorses selectively choosing the most consequential races in which to make recommendations. Now, this decision by the LA Times owner not to endorse was depicted similarly to the way Jeff Bezos' decision not to endorse was, as some kind of frightened fear of tyranny on the horizon of some sort of advanced anticipatory attempt to assuage the new dictator, Donald Trump, should he win. Even though the owner of the LA Times is a multi-billionaire worth $7 billion, was a big donor of Hillary Clinton in 2016, although he also, once Trump won in 2017, talked to the Trump administration about a potential cabinet position. But as you're about to see, despite the fact that it was entirely omitted from any of the narrative that the media created about what this non-endorsement meant by the LA Times, the real reason why they chose not to endorse was something that was nowhere mentioned because it conflicted with the narrative the media wanted to create. Here from the New York Times on October 23rd, quote, LA Times editorial chief quits after the owner blocks a Harris endorsement. Mariel Garza said the editorial board was prepared to endorse Kamala Harris, but the paper's owner, Patrick Soon Shung, decided not to make an endorsement in the presidential race. Quote, in an interview with Columbia Journalism Review, Mariel Garza, who held the, title, the title's editorial editor, said she had quit because, quote, I want to make it clear that I am not okay with us being silent. In dangerous times, honest people need to stand up. This is how I'm standing up. Ms. Garza said that the editorial board had planned to endorse uh, Ms. Harris, but that Dr. Patrick Chun Shong, the billionaire owner of the Los Angeles Times, decided this month that the newspaper would not make any endorsement for president. The paper did not explain to readers why it was not issuing an endorsement. Now, as it turns out, the owner has a daughter, an adult daughter, she's 32 years old, who is very open about her politics. She tends to be very left-wing. She's particularly pro-Palestinian and vehemently opposed to the Israeli war in Gaza and the, and the policy of the Biden and Harris administration of funding that war, of supporting it, of arming it, of diplomatically protecting it. And she has played an increasingly important role and an influential role in all of her father's businesses, including the management of the LA Times. And so although it got depicted as this, quote, cowardly move by this billionaire afraid of being put in a camp when Trump wins, actually, the reason why the newspaper 
decided to abstain and not endorse Kamala Harris was not for any of those reasons, but instead was a much more substantive reason as explained by the owner's daughter. Here from The Hollywood Reporter, this was from today, the daughter of the Los Angeles Times owner says that the paper is refusing to quote, endorse a candidate that is overseeing a war on children. Patrick Soon Shang's outspoken daughter, Nika, posted on X on Friday that, quote, genocide is a line in the sand. In a thread of social media post on Thursday, Nika Soon Shang attributed the decision to an opposition to Democratic candidate Kamala Harris's position on the war on Gaza. She wrote that her father, a South African transplant surgeon, had worked as an emergency surgeon in a hospital in Soweto during apartheid. Quote, for my family, apartheid is not a vague concept. Maintaining that the decision to endorse was one made by the, New the Los Angeles Times editorial board, Nika added, quote, this is not a vote for Donald Trump. This is a refusal to endorse a candidate that is overseeing a war on children. In other words, she was saying the reason we didn't endorse Kamala Harris is not because we're afraid of Donald Trump. It's because we are so vehemently opposed to Kamala Harris and Joe Biden's support for apartheid Israel and for what she later called a genocide in Gaza that we cannot in good conscience endorse a candidate who we believe is committing genocide and supporting apartheid. That is a red line for our family. None of that got noted in any of these attempts to equate Jeff Bezos and the LA Times family, who owns the paper, as being frightened by Trump's authoritarianism and cowardly. If anything, refusing to endorse Kamala Harris based on its support, the administration's support for Israel, when you're a newspaper in Los Angeles, is quite a courageous thing to do with almost no benefits. It's the opposite of cowardice. Here from the AP today, quote, two more LA Times editorial board members resign after the paper withholds a Harris endorsement. So you see this kind of, uh, this uh, sort of attempt to suggest that what these papers are doing are just a byproduct of the fear that people now have about the new uh, Hitler that is about to be uh, elected. Here is former Obama White House official Ben Rhodes, who utterly ignored the explanation by the LA Times about why they refused to endorse Kamala Harris because they find her support for the Israeli wars to be unconscionable and across a line that they cannot support. He ignored that completely and he pretended that the two papers have the same rationale. And here's how he attempted to describe it. Quote, there is no logic that isn't damning as to why the Washington Post and LA Times feel they can endorse in every local, state, and federal election other than a presidential race. It's not that these endorsements tip the balance in an election. It's that the self-censorship because you are afraid of retribution from an authoritarian tells you everything you need to know about the priorities of management. A lot of the Russian oligarchs who owned media properties in the late 1990s helped or enabled Putin's ride to power, thinking it would help them. Today, Putin controls every media outlet in Russia. And these people live just in a fantasy land where they create their own narratives that serve their own interests about what is self-serving for them to believe. I mean, if you create a world in which it's incredibly courageous and an act of conscience and self-sacrifice, to speak out against Donald Trump, then it means every time they do that in the world they've created, they're somehow engaged in an act of great bravery, of putting themselves in harm's way, at risk, of going to a camp because of their conscious-driven, courageous decision to speak out against Donald Trump. This is what, of course, they want to believe about themselves. These are people who have never sacrificed or risked for a cause in their entire life. And so, of course, they want to believe that they're on the front line of some important and scary cause, namely stopping Donald Trump, as if there's a whole line of people who have been murdered and dropped from helicopters and consigned to dungeons for life for doing what the media does every single day and has been doing for eight straight years, which is denouncing Trump in the most hysterical and extremist terms possible. Just to highlight one particularly obnoxious example, 
Jennifer Rubin, who used to be a Republican operative, she used to, in fact, be such a supporter of Mitt Romney during the 2012 election that it made people uncomfortable that she somehow seemed in love with Mitt Romney. She's now at the Washington Post. She's become, like most neocons, which is what she is, a devoted hater of Donald Trump, but also a passionate supporter of Kamala Harris and the Democratic Party. And in response to the news that one of the editors of the LA Times quit the paper in response to his non-endorsement, she went onto Twitter that day and wrote, quote, Brava, this is courage, and shame on her boss for not joining her. So she was saying that the people at the LA Times who quit were being courageous. The people who refused to quit deserve shame. Obviously, she didn't know at the time she was shaming people for not quitting, that two days later her own paper was about to do exactly the same thing. And the question, of course, then became, um, was Jen Rubin going to quit in response to her own paper's decision also not to endorse, given that she spent all day on Wednesday heaping scorn on everybody who was too cowardly to quit the LA Times in response to this non-endorsement. And not only didn't she quit today, she just disappeared the whole day and then she came back and started talking about other things, didn't even have the courage to mention, let alone denounce, let alone resign in response to her own paper's decision not to endorse. I mean, at least the LA Times had a principled policy-based reason for refusing to endorse Kamala Harris, that they find her support for Israel so morally objectionable that they can't in good conscience support her as opposed to Jeff Bezos just sort of declaring neutrality on the part of the Washington Post from here on out. Just imagine what kind of person you have to be to make this whole melodramatic showing spectacle of yourself by heaping scorn and shame on other journalists at the LA Times because they're too scared to quit and do what they're supposed to do, which is resign in response to their paper's non-endorsement while... Two days later, when your own paper does exactly that same thing, but for less noble motives, you don't even have the courage to mention it, to denounce it, let alone to quit, as you were demanding that other people do. But I think what this really shows, I mean, first of all, it, it definitely shows that they still have not come to grips with how little sway they have over the American public, with how hated they are, how distrusted they are, how much contempt that they're held in by the American public that they actually think that somehow the New York Times and the LA Times and the Washington Post and CNN telling people to go vote for Donald for Kamala Harris will make the slightest impact on anybody who already isn't doing that. It also shows that they really do believe, and I've pointed this out many times, that they believe the purpose and function of journalistic outlets is no longer to report or to journalism. It's to do anything and everything to help the Democratic Party win. It's why I quit The Intercept. Precisely because at the time they refused to allow me to do my job of reporting on these documents I knew were authentic because they wanted to make sure that The Intercept wasn't perceived as helping Donald Trump win or helping Joe Biden lose. And that's what you should do when you're in a media outlet that is non-journalistic and doesn't let you do journalism, which is you should quit. You don't quit because your paper refuses to become a political activist. You quit when your paper becomes a political activist in response to their failure to do journalism. But in this case, they really do see the function of these media outlets is to do everything possible to help Donald Trump be defeated, even if it means lying or disinformation or anything else. But I also think the last point that it underscores all of this illustrates is that, and we talked about this last night, they really have convinced themselves that they're endangered, that they're going to go to camps if Donald Trump wins. One of Keith Overman's tweets today was to Jeff Bezos saying, even you can do whatever you want, but still, when Trump wins, he's going to deport your wife, Lauren Sanchez who is a U.S.-born American citizen, and then you and I are both going to be sent to camp, the camps anyway. I mean, they've created these Holocaust fantasies in their head, these Nazi fantasies in their head, and they've really convinced themselves of it, and they've lost their minds completely. But if you really believe that Adolf Hitler is on the ballot and has a good chance to win, 
of course you sh will believe that news outlets should abandon, abandon the journalistic role in favor of the far more important goal of preventing Adolf Hitler from winning. And this is what they've been believing for eight years. It's why they've been willing to spread disinformation, even if they know that it's false, because the goal is not to spread true information or to inform, it's to help the Democratic Party win. That has become their explicit mission, the expectation of their function, and all of this, this rage over a mere decision to remain neutral and not to endorse, it really illustrates how these people see their themselves, the function of corporate media outlets, as well as the imminent 2024 election about which they're getting increasingly deranged in full panic mode and completely irrational. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.